independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Happy, happy new year, True Crime Army. It's the start of a new decade, new goals, a new outlook on life, and more episodes of Military Murder. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of the new you or the old you, whatever. I am your host, Margot, and for those of you joining the crew for the first time, in this True Crime podcast, I cover cases with a military nexus. Maybe it's a military suspect, a veteran suspected of murder, or maybe it's a military spouse who snaps. If there's a murder and a military connection, I'll cover it on this podcast. But don't you fret. You don't have to know anything about the military to enjoy listening. I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, you're home. A few shout outs before we begin the story. This holiday, I was so pleased to find out that two very special listeners decided to donate to the Military Murder Booster Club. By the way, that's not really a thing. I just made that up. But I like the sound of it. What do you think? Military Murder Booster Club. And well, two loyal listeners decided that they wanted to give a wonderful gift to the podcast. And those two listeners are Chief Huey and Tiffany Bowers. I was skipping around my house like a little girl when I saw that because they independently surprised me. So this week, Chief Huey and Tiffany, they are this episode's producers. Don't worry. If you want to join in on this giving fun and you want to help produce an episode of Military Murder with a contribution of any size... Visit MilitaryMurderPodcast.com or you can just do it directly through PayPal. Just use our email, MilitaryMurderPodcast at gmail.com. Again, a million thanks to Chief Huey and Tiffany Bowers. And one more thing. On New Year's Eve, I was pleasantly surprised to see that CastBox chose Military Murder as a staff favorite. That is such an honor to be a featured podcast on the front page of their app. If you don't already use CastBox for your podcast listening, you should consider it. It's a great way to listen to podcasts and interact with the community. You can add comments or feedback for your favorite podcast. You can ask questions in the community section, and you can just read and browse hashtags for hours. Let's move on to the story of someone who has literally turned a new leaf in 2020. For as long as I can remember, we have been a nation at war, and this war has affected everyone. There is no way to hide. Since starting this podcast, I'm amazed how many parents of military members have reached out to me with their support and how they like taking a peek behind the proverbial curtain that is the military and the military justice system. And well, I never planned to cover war crimes. In fact, one of my slogans is true crimes, not war crimes. But the case I am covering today has divided a nation. Some think it's a war crime committed by a baby faced killer who wanted to prove his worth to his soldiers while others think he's a true American hero who only had a split second to make a life or death decision. And well, people are confused. What happened? Who is Clint Lawrence? What exactly is a presidential pardon? Today, I will discuss the case against Army First Lieutenant Clint Lawrence. His case has been in the news since 2012 and came to an interesting conclusion on November 15th, 2019. I am going to cover this case as neutral as I can. There are vast differences in opinions in this case. It is hard to be in the middle. And by the end of this, you will probably have chosen a side. But my goal is to present both sides with, of course, a little bit of Margot commentary. I will tell you exactly where each position comes from when discussing these wildly different opinions and facts. But as I usually do, I rely heavily on the facts as found by the court. Politics aside, let's get into the murder case against First Lieutenant Clint Lawrence. Now, let's dig in. There is so much information on the web about Clint Lawrence, but, you know, I had to focus on only a few sources because towards the end, it all kind of gets repetitive. The sources that I focused on were the 2017 Army Court of Criminal Appeals Court Opinion, the 2019 STARS documentary called Leavenworth, directed by Paul Palowski, a 2017 Task and Purpose article by Adam Linham, various articles by the Army Times, Clint's personal letter to President Obama, the 2019 Press Secretary's news release, freeclint.com website, and the UAP website. 
As usual, I like to go in chronological order, so here goes. Let's start with Clint Lawrence. Who is he? Clint's biography that I'm going to discuss with you today was taken directly from the United American Patriots website, the UAP website. Clint Allen Lawrence was born on December 13, 1984, to Tracy and Anna Lawrence in Hobart, Oklahoma. Although he was born in Oklahoma, he was raised in Greenville, Texas. Clint comes from a very large extended family, and they're extremely close and supportive. Clint has two older sisters and a younger brother, and he also has a cousin who was born the same year as him. And this cousin, it's, she's a female, and they're basically like twins. Clint's a hard worker, and he's always he always has to have his hands in something. In high school, he worked multiple jobs. He even became the manager of a store, like I said, when he was, I think he was like 16, and he was a police explorer. After 9-11 at the age of 17, he attempted to enlist in the army. So he like trots over to the recruiter's office and says, I want to serve and protect our country. And the recruiter is like, OK, cool. Here's this form. Get it signed by your parents and we'll take you. Well, his parents were not about to let their baby faced 17 year old go to war and said, mm, not on our watch, honey. You can do whatever you want to do when you're 18. But until then, you are not going anywhere. A year went by and on Clint's 18th birthday, he walked on over to the recruiter's office and enlisted in the army as a military policeman, MP. He was getting out of Texas. On April 15th, 2003, Clint went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri to boot camp and tech school. His first duty station, however, was Kunsan, South Korea. In South Korea, he was a high speed soldier. He quickly went from driver to gunner to team lead to squad leader to traffic accident investigator and ultimately D.A.R.E. school resource officer. He was soldier of the month, and then he was non-commissioned officer of the quarter for the 8th MP Brigade. And within two years, Clint was already a sergeant, which is an E-5. After about two years in Korea during the fall of 2005, he was sent to basic paratroop training at Fort Benning, Georgia, to attend airborne school to earn his, quote, wings. According to GoArmy.com, Basic Airborne Course is a three-week class that teaches soldiers the techniques involved in parachuting from airplanes and landing safely. And the whole purpose of the course is to qualify soldiers to use a parachute as a means of combat deployment. Airborne soldiers have a long and distinguished tradition of being an elite body of fighting men and women, people who have always set the example for determination and courage. And so this is like pretty bad A for someone to earn their wings. After earning his wings, he moved to his next duty station, which was the 4th Brigade Combat Team, Airborne, the Army has such long names, 25th Infantry Division at Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska. Okay, so basically his next duty station was in Alaska. So in September of 2006, Clint deployed for a 15-month tour to Iraq, which from everything that I read was uneventful. Upon his return from deployment, he was accepted into the Army's Elite Green to Gold program. And this is a program that takes high-speed enlisted members and basically pays them full active duty pay, but they don't have to be in the military. Their full-time job is to go to school, participate in ROTC to become officers, and basically get good grades and get a degree. And so you get free school on top of getting paid as a full-time soldier. I mean, it's a pretty sweet deal. Tell any starving college student about this gig and they're going to be lining up to get in on this deal. So Clint began college at the University of North Texas in the fall of 2008. And two years later, in the spring of 2010, Clint got a degree and commissioned as an infantry second lieutenant. He returned to Fort Benning, Georgia, where he did infantry basic officer school and air assault school before joining the 82nd Airborne Division. According to GoArmy.com, Air Assault School is a 10-day course that basically preps soldiers to get in and out of a situation using different forms of transportation and assault helicopters. So really stealthy. Talk about high speed. Clint did a lot from the point that he entered the Army in 2003 up until, you know, 2010. I mean, he did a lot. He traveled a lot. He went to a lot of school. I mean, he had a lot of training. At this point in Clint's career, he's riding high. He was a fast burner. By 2012, he had been in the Army for nine years. He had a successful enlisted career. He spent two years practically as a civilian where his full-time job was to go to school. And now he was a first lieutenant. If anyone could predict anyone's career, you would think this guy was going to make colonel, maybe even general. 
but his 2012 deployment would prove to spring him into a different spotlight, one that would pit soldier against soldier. In March of 2012, Clint was told he'd be deploying to Afghanistan. So he called his family and his mother cried. And listen, it doesn't matter how long you're in the military. Making that call, the call to tell your family that you are going to a war zone sucks. Yes, it's what we sign up for, but you are never more prepared for death than when you get ready for a deployment. I mean, you ensure that your will and estate plan is up to date. You make sure that your bills are on auto pay. You update your life insurance plans. And some people even make funeral arrangements before they go. Because listen, it's possible that you may never come back. And military people do not want to burden their families. And man, this really sucks. But it's what we sign up for. But this wasn't Clint's first rodeo. He had already spent 15 months in Iraq. So why would Afghanistan be any different? In March of 2012, Clint deployed to Afghanistan as a squadron liaison officer. And so he was a squadron liaison officer to the commander for the 4th Squadron, 73rd Cavalry Regiment, 4th Brigade Combat Team, 82nd Airborne Division. That's just such a long title. While serving in this capacity, he was at the headquarters level. And so he wasn't seeing day-to-day combat. He wasn't seeing combat. And although he was behind the scenes, though, he knew the high level intel of what was going on around the surrounding areas of the base and what areas were kinetic and not kinetic. And so kinetic means seeing a lot of war fighting, etc. So even though he was not in combat, he knew what was going on. And according to the Leavenworth documentary and the Army Court of Criminal Appeals court opinion, the area surrounding the base was seeing an uptick in enemy movement. In late June 2012, First Lieutenant Dominic Latino, who was a platoon leader, was injured by an IED and he couldn't return to lead his soldiers. So the brigade could have chosen from a slew of first lieutenants to replace Latino, but they chose Clint Lawrence. Morale in the first platoon was already hurting and they had a number of injured soldiers in their group and they just lost a good leader who was still alive but badly injured. So Clint told his attorney in the Stars documentary that before transitioning from headquarters to the platoon, he was specifically told that there was some disciplinary issues within the platoon he was going to lead and that they were getting too chummy with the platoon leader. His exact orders were, quote, you need to go in strong and you need to police them up, end quote. So Clint had kind of an uphill battle here. He was in a very kinetic area at an outpost named Strong Point Payenzi. I'll just call it Strong Point P. And this was located near the village of Zarenzai in the Zarai district in Kandahar province. And he was going to lead a group of guys who had already bonded and they were pretty upset to have lost their leader. So this team of soldiers had already been through the five stages of team development. Educational point here. Most people in the military are taught about team development at some point. So if you're in the military or I think it might be military officers, I'm not sure. But you'll attend some sort of training where they talk about the five stages of team development. In 1965, a man named Bruce Tuckman taught that teams go through five phases before they become a good, balanced, productive team. And those stages are forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. And well, Clint was coming in hot while this team was already performing and adjourning. And now the army was throwing in this new guy into the mix. But this is not an uncommon occurrence in the military. I mean, you just pivot and adjust as needed. The following facts are taken directly from the 2017 Army Appeals Court decision. On June 30th, 2012, which is day one, this is the first day that Clint walks in as the new leader of this group. The team members, they stated in the STARS documentary that Clint did a decent job of trying to get to know his troops. He brought each one individually in to talk about their goals. At first, the troops were hesitant about this new guy, but they heard that he was prior enlisted, so he immediately got street credit. That same day, day one, Clint was leading his platoon back from a mission, and as they approached the entry control point, there was a villager with a young kid. The villager was at the gate complaining about this concertina wire on the road that was impeding his ability to farm on his land, And he was like, I want this removed. Clint was agitated and he told the villager that if he touched the wire, he and his family would be killed. So witnesses then claimed that Clint pointed a loaded gun at the child. Can you imagine the horror of this villager? 
And then Clint said, quote, come back for the Friday Shura and bring 20 people, end quote. Ashura is a meeting between coalition forces and the elders of the Afghanistan town or neighborhood where the Afghanistan elders are able to discuss their issues with the Americans or coalition partners or discuss things that they need or issues that they have been having. Listen, at the end of the day, soldiers are told to win hearts and minds of the Afghanistan people, and they do this by helping the community build their villages. So question, Would you come back to a base after someone yelled at you and then pointed a loaded gun at your kid? I don't know about you, but I would not. I would be pretty fearful and I would be pretty, pretty pissed too. Day two, July 1st, 2012. Clint climbed the tower overlooking the local community and told a soldier to shoot harassing fire towards the villagers. Clint assured the other soldier, hey, this is necessary to ensure a good turnout at the Shura. And throughout the documentary and news articles, there are a lot of talks about the Shura, but I'm unsure why Clint was focused so much on it. I mean, I don't know, was his leadership being judged by how many people came to the Shura? It's possible. When Clint told his soldier to shoot warning shots, the soldier obeyed. Of course, these gunshots were not silent, so the headquarters called the base and asked, uh, is everything okay? We heard gunshots. Clint then told his non-commissioned soldier, NCO, to lie and say that they were receiving fire. And it is unclear from the court opinion if the NCO lied or if Clint got online and lied, but that's just what was said. Okay, so we got day one and day two. Day three, July 2nd, 2012. The platoon was getting ready to go on a mission outside the wire, which just means outside the protection of an American military base or a coalition uh, military base. But you can't just lollygag off base, right? You have to be prepared and the heads of the mission will get together and go over protocol, whether what routes they're going to take and when they expect to return, that type of stuff. On this morning, Clint met with the Afghanistan National Army, the ANA, And at this briefing, according to Clint, it was announced that you could allegedly shoot a motorcycle on site. No questions asked because motorcycles were likely to have bad guys on them. Uh, It is unclear who said that this was a change to the rules of engagement, whether it was the ANA or if Clint just made this up. However, the record shows that Clint was putting up signs around the base saying that no motorcycles would be permitted in the area of operations. And I'm not exactly sure what the sign said, but it was something to that effect. I would like to take a quick moment to explain rules of engagement, ROEs. Many people don't know this, but the U.S. military cannot just go into a combat zone and kill anybody on site. That's not a real thing. In order to make sure that military members don't go rogue, the powers that be created rules in order to assist military members in making a split second threat assessment. General David Petraeus, who was the commander of the International Security Assistance in Afghanistan, ISAF, in 2010, he's a four-star general. According to Adam Linham, a senior staff writer for the task and purpose, General Petraeus tightened the rules of engagement during his command, which were in place while deployed to, quote, give soldiers pause to force military members to consider if the kill was worth it. In his directive, Petraeus urged soldiers to hold their fire when unsure if a target is a combatant or a civilian, but he made it clear that they had every right to defend themselves, end quote. Additionally, these rules of engagement were particularly important in Afghanistan, where the coalition partners were attempting to win hearts and minds instead of going into locations, guns blazing, blowing everything up, you know? The intent was to get help from the local community to find the bad guys and help the community rebuild their country. At the same time that Clint told everyone that motorcycles were fair game, Sergeant Mike McGinnis was baffled. Like, that's not a real thing. We can't just shoot a non-threat riding a motorcycle. And McGinnis told everyone that they were not to take any orders to shoot from anyone but him. Meaning, like, don't shoot unless me, Mike McGinnis, gives you the order. McGinnis had been deployed a few months by this point, and this seemed absurd that you can just shoot a motorcycle on site. In fact, saying that a motorcycle is fair game is like treating everyone on a motorcycle like they're carrying a gun, and this just didn't sound right to the troop. 
Now, as they were getting ready to leave the base, a few villagers were at the gate complaining about the shots fired the night before from the watchtower. So it was not Friday yet, and Clint was not going to discuss any villager issues until the Friday Shura. So Clint started yelling and told them to leave, and when they refused, he began counting down. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, until they finally left. The patrol then headed towards the town. Most of the platoon was in a single file line on foot, and there was one military vehicle following along. According to the soldiers who participated in the STARS documentary, they were in a single file line. Specialist Leon was first, then Specialist Fitzgerald, then Private First Class Skelton, then Lieutenant Lawrence, and somewhere in the rear was Staff Sergeant McGinnis, who was the third in command. According to the Army Court of Criminal Appeals court opinion, within minutes, Private First Class James Skelton, the intelligence specialist, called out to Clint to tell him, hey, I see a motorcycle with three adult males on it. Clint asked zero questions and ordered Skelton to shoot. Private First Class Skelton obeyed and shot twice, missing both times. The three Afghanistan men who were on this motorcycle immediately stopped the motorcycle, got off, and walked towards the front of the patrol. And the front of the patrol was led by five ANA. The ANA waved the guys off and told them, hey, go back to your motorcycle and just wait. And the three men complied. Simultaneously, Clint radioed for the gun truck to shoot the three men. Private Shiloh, the gunner in charge of the large weapon above the truck, shot the men, killing two and hitting the third man before he escaped through the field. As you can imagine, the villagers heard the gunshots and they ran to see the two dead men. Meanwhile, according to the Star's documentary, all of the soldiers on 1st Platoon were frozen in fear and they believed that they had just witnessed a murder. Do you ever get sick of how many times you're scrambling to figure out dinner plans? I mean, dinner is every night. How can someone be so unprepared for a daily task? I'm super guilty of this sometimes. Well, fret no more, because with HelloFresh, you never have to worry about what's for dinner, because HelloFresh will deliver farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes directly to your doorstep. March is National Nutrition Month, and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious, dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals under 700 calories and with only one-third the sodium in other meals. This month, the dietitian win menu includes pecan crusted chicken, one pan spiced turkey lettuce wrap, creamy Dijon dill chicken, and Southwest stuffed green peppers. I recently tried the Southwest stuffed green peppers and they are delicious. And while this meal appeals hardcore and hard to make, the recipe was super easy to follow. It took roughly 30 minutes to make the entire meal, so I call that a win. HelloFresh is truly life-changing. No more worrying about mealtime. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60. That's Military M-A-M-A and the number 60. And use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60 and use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. At this point, you have one motorcycle that is still standing on its kickstand, two dead men on the floor near the motorcycle, and the third man got the hell out of Dodge. Clint then ordered Shiloh to disable the motorcycle, presumably by shooting it. But Shiloh said, uh-uh, because there was a young boy near the bodies and the motorcycle. Before Shiloh shot the kill shot, there were no observable weapons or radios and the three men were not showing any hostility toward the U.S. forces. In fact, there was a field that divided the men on the motorcycle and the soldiers. Shiloh testified that the only reason he shot the men was because his superior officer, Clint, told him to do it. After the engagement, helicopter support arrived to try to find the third motorcyclist who had run off. The pilots of the helicopter took aerial photos of the dead bodies lying next to the motorcycle. Sergeant First Class Ayers, the platoon sergeant, asked Clint what happened. 
Clint told Ayers that before the shots were fired, the helicopter had sent him intel that the motorcyclist had weapons. When damage occurs in combat, it is protocol to conduct a battle damage assessment once everything is clear. Battle damage assessment includes taking pictures of the damage, obtaining biometric data, and testing for any explosive residue on the bodies. There was a specific member of Clint's team who was entrusted with conducting this, this assessment, Private First Class Skelton. According to the court opinion, Clint, however, didn't ask nor want Private First Class Skelton to conduct the battle damage assessment because he, quote, won't like what he sees, end quote. Instead, two other soldiers who were not trained in conducting battle damage assessments did the best they could without the proper equipment. By this point, the villagers were all gathering around and Clint asked them to take the bodies. One thing was clear. There were no weapons or bomb-making materials on the deceased men. All they had were scissors, keys, cucumbers, and ID cards. Clint then told the soldier with the radio to report that a battle damage assessment couldn't be done because the bodies were removed before the platoon could get to them. So they actually did do like a semi-decent battle damage assessment, but then Clint is telling his soldier to radio in that they weren't able to do one because the, the villagers had taken the body, whereas they had done a battle damage assessment and Clint was the one who told the villagers to take the body. The, the soldier who was in charge of the radio probably looked at Clint like, what the heck? And Clint then took the radio, spoke to the troop commander himself, Captain Swanson, and made the false report himself. This already seemed like an intense day for the troop, and I imagine the stress level was skyrocketing at this point. But more gunshots would ring in the village again, and Clint's team would be involved in yet another engagement before returning to base. According to Clint's clemency package, once this engagement was over, the platoon continued on their route. They set up in a building approximately 500 meters from the first engagement. McGinnis and Private First Class Carson identified military-aged men scouting first platoon. And this information was not in the actual court opinion. In fact, according to the Star's documentary, information about the following enemy engagement was not allowed into Clint's later court-martial. So you have two engagements, the first where Clint orders an alleged enemy threat eliminated, but the rest of the soldiers say he killed innocent villagers. And my assumption is that information about the second engagement wasn't allowed into evidence because anything that happened after the shooting of the two Afghanistan men on the motorcycles would not be relevant to a question of their murder. So in any event, McGinnis and Carson are set up on a building roof. They notice some men crouching, pointing, acting suspicious, and holding radios. So the soldiers eliminate them, a.k.a. kill them. Intercepts later revealed that one of the men who had been eliminated had said over the radio, quote, There are Americans on the roof. We want to do something to them, end quote. According to John Mayer, who is Clint's new defense attorney, who is also a Reserve Army Judge Advocate, stated no one was court-martialed for killing during the second engagement. So as I sit here in my quiet office and you listen to this story from your car or from the gym or even from the safety of your house or your job, we're all passing judgment, right, as Monday morning quarterbacks. But we don't really know what happened. But that July 2nd, 2012, was a heck of a day for Clint and his platoon. After the mission was over, Private First Class Skelton had to report what happened that day to the Tactical Operations Center, the TAC. But before Skelton headed over there, Clint stopped him and said, hey, maybe you don't mention anything about the battle damage assessment and what we found on the guys, okay? How about you keep your lips sealed? I imagine Skelton's face and the horror he must have felt that his senior officer was asking him to lie by omission. But off Skelton went for his brief, and as soon as he got there, he made it known I need to talk to Captain Swanson. And Private First Class Skelton spilled the beans, or at least his version of events. Basically, as I've seen many a meme on Instagram and Twitter, there are three versions to every story. Your version, their version, and somewhere in between, the truth. Skelton told Swanson a battle damage assessment was conducted, but they found nothing threatening on the men. No weapons, no bomb-making materials, nada, nothing. 
Simultaneously, intel was coming into base that the two guys Clint ordered killed were village elders, not insurgents. So Swanson needed to act fast, and he did. According to Stars, he separated Clint from his soldiers, Clint go over there, and the rest of you go to the chow hall. No one knew why they were at the chow hall, although some could imagine. Clint started thinking his new platoon was about to gang up on him. As told to Stars by Captain Swanson, Captain Swanson had prepared some questions for the group. He handed out statement forms and asked each individual to answer questions. And they did just that. As Captain Swanson read all of the statements, the statements told a harrowing tale of what he thought was murder. Swanson was sort of freaked out because the statements were very similar. So he pulls McGinnis back and says, hey, did you guys make this up? McGinnis says, no, sir. But through it all, two stories emerged. Clint's story and everyone else's story. An investigation into Clint's actions on his third day in command had officially begun. Clint was suspended from leading troops pending the investigation. And as reported by the Washington Post, Clint was stripped of his weapon and relegated to a desk job. But if Clint felt some sort of way, so did his troops. Many of the guys in the troop felt like they were ostracized while they were deployed because no one else realized what the big deal was. Good, more insurgents eliminated. But the guys who were there, the guys who were there with Clint, the guys who saw the motorcycle guys living and then saw them gunned down, they felt differently. They knew this was murder. There was no doubt in their minds that those men on the motorcycle were not a threat to them at that very moment. And this is where I leave you today. Next week in part two of the Clint Loran story, I will bring you the conclusion of the saga. I know, I know, episodes with a to-be-continued feel like torture, but that's just how it will be this week, because if not, it would have been too long. I don't like my episodes to go super, super duper long, so... I wanted to cut this one down into two parts. Don't forget to come back next week where you will hear about soldiers being pitted against soldiers, military courts deciding whether a prominent attorney did his best or whether he was actually incompetent, and ultimately a family and a legal team that would stop at nothing to get their son out of the nation's maximum security military prison. You won't want to miss it. So come back and be sure to tell all your friends about military murder this week, okay? You are all my biggest recruits. I know we have listeners in every state and over 80 countries. Now, I just need each and every one of you to pass along the message. If you haven't already done so, take a few seconds to rate and review the show. You can do this either on Apple Podcasts or CastBox. And if you're using a desktop to enjoy the show, you can leave a review on Stitcher. And of course, don't forget you can leave a review on my Facebook page, which you can find at Military True Crime. This episode was created by me, Margot, produced by our lovely listeners, Chief Huey and Tiffany Bowers, and all of the music was created by TyOps. To find a list of all the sources I pieced together to bring you the story, I encourage you to visit www.militarymurderpodcast.com to check out the links. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous nail-biting week, and I'll keep digging to bring you the conclusion of the Clint Lawrence story. Shh, let's work another podcast.